Welcome to Prison Professors. I'm really enthusiastic this morning because I get to present a subject matter expert, an individual who's got just a depth and breadth of knowledge that is unmatched and that will be of extreme value to any individual, any justice impacted individual who is going into the system, any family member who has a loved one in prison. And of course, we pipe our programs into jails and prisons across America. And so there are many people in pretrial that are going to want to listen to John Gustin. He is going to tell us about his uh, multi-decade career with the Bureau of Prisons and overseeing a an area of the Bureau of Prisons that is very very important to anybody in, in the federal prison system, including the defense attorneys that represent them. So this is John Gustin, and, and it's an honor and a privilege to have you speaking on the Prison Professors Program. Welcome this morning, John. Thank you, Michael. I'm very happy to be here. Could you give our audience the, the background of your career with the Bureau of Prisons? Yeah, Michael, I had a, a rather unique career with the Bureau of Prisons. I did just over 24 years with the Bureau of Prisons, and only four years of that was actually inside a prison. And after that first four years where I was an officer and a counselor inside the prison, I went out to what was called community corrections at the time, is now called residential reentry. And I went out to community corrections and started providing oversight and direction to what at the time was called halfway houses and is now called residential reentry centers. So I started doing that out in the Seattle office as a contract oversight specialist, um, then was transitioned out to the Minneapolis office where I was the office manager in Minneapolis, and then came to DC and have been in DC for, for a rather long time. I spent almost 16 years in DC out of my career. And the last seven of that, I was the administrator of national programs for all residential reentry centers nationwide and for all community-based programs nationwide. So you, you work with a, with a big team, particularly during those last seven years, and you said all regions. Could you help our audience understand how many regions there are and how the hierarchy, the, the, the hierarchy goes from your level to the different people that are overseeing the different the six different regions yeah so interesting enough um when i became the administrator of residential reentry back in 2014 we did a restructuring of residential reentry altogether so we took that authority away from the regions so as you said there are, there are six regions within the bureau of prisons uh prior to that time prior to 2014 all the regions had individual authority over the residential reentry programs. But we really wanted to create a continuity of service and make sure that we were all standardized nationwide. So we took that and we reorganized all residential reentry, all community corrections operations under the central office, which at the time fell under me. So that means then that the individual that, that gets released in the North Atlantic region should theoretically have the same experience uh, as somebody that gets released in the Western region. Is that accurate? That, that's correct. And that's really what we strove to do. We really wanted to make sure that we had kind of standardized programming nationwide. We wanted to make sure that the reentry journey, as you said, for somebody in the Mid-Atlantic was, was similar to somebody in the, in the Western region, and that the policies and procedures were applied all in the same way, which was really a difficult undertaking. <laughs> well, that would be, of course, because there are how many people staff under your purview and how many uh, p uh, justice-impacted people are under the purview. So. How many staff members are, are, are reporting to you across the nation? And then how many in, uh, people do they oversee that transitioned into the community? Yeah, so when I retired from the Bureau of Prisons in December of last year, so December of 2021, I had almost 350 people that reported to the Residential Reentry Management Branch, and they were overseeing about 15,000 justice-involved individuals who were out in the community in, in one of our many programs. So there's the, so clearly you have a a real depth of experience. Maybe I think it would be helpful for us to to help the individuals that are going into the system. Uh, what how the process works from from the time when when they're 
being considered for placement in an RRM. Uh, I don't know if it's an RRM, RRC, or day reporting center. And I think we should probably, before we get into that, what are those clarifications between an RRM, an RRC, and a, and a day reporting center? And are, are there more than those three designations? Yeah. So an RRM is the residential reentry manager in one of the 24 field offices that provides supervision and oversight for those residential reentry centers, the RRCs, in his geographic area of responsibility. So for example, when I was the manager in Minneapolis, I provided oversight for Minnesota, North and South Dakota. So any RRC or residential reentry center that was in those areas fell under my, my purview or my area of responsibility. A day reporting center is quite a bit different. There's only two nationwide. There's one in Memphis and one in Sacramento. Those are centers in which justice involved individuals who are residing at home can report to on a daily or whatever periodic basis that is deemed necessary for programming, for case management, for those type of things. Day reporting center is significantly different from home confinement. Home confinement is usually managed by an RRC or halfway house where a day reporting center has no residential component whatsoever. So, so the, and, the, and are those the, the three different uh, designations that were, that, that fell beneath your higher in the, in your, in the hierarchy and are our, the RR manager that oversees the RRCs and then day reporting center is kind of on parallel to an RRC. Yes. The other thing that, that RRMs are responsible for is any contracts with local jails or prisons where we're housing somebody in local facilities and also all the juveniles that are designated to the Bureau of Prisons fall under the purview of the residential reentry manager. So if I'm going into the system and I want to qualify at the earliest possible time, who are the, the stakeholders that are going to be reviewing my particular case? What, what, they're in the Bureau of Prisons. Is it just the case manager or is there somebody else that's, that's assessing me? Yeah, so generally within about 18 months prior to your anticipated placement in the community, the case manager is, is doing a team of you, normally scheduled teams every six months, every year, depending on where you're at. They're doing a team and they're recommending you for placement in an RRC. And it's incumbent upon the justice involved individual when they're being reviewed to present to that case manager, to present to that, that counselor or that member of the unit team, what their reentry plan involves. You know, prior to my incarceration, I was doing this. When I get out of incarceration, this is what I plan to do. This is the assistance I need in doing that. Um, I've got a place to live or I don't have a place to live. This is who I'm going to be residing with. This is the type of employment I'm going to be seeking. And here's my plan. And you have to be very realistic about that plan. And you have to understand that if you're a lawyer, you're probably not going to go back out and start practicing law tomorrow. You know, if you're a doctor, you're probably not going to go out and start practicing doctor. But you have to start somewhere. So you really need to, and Michael, this is one of the reasons why I like what you do so well, is the planning during your entire period of incarceration from day one, you should be planning for what are you going to do when you get out? And, you know, what does that life look like and what tools do you need to do that? And I think that's critically important that you present that in writing to your case manager every time you go into a meeting with the case manager where you're, you're discussing your, your plan for incarceration. What program should you attend? Because it should be driven by what your goals are and what the individual goals are of the justice involved individual, because otherwise it's going to be the goals of that case manager. And that, that's really not beneficial to, to either party, because then you don't have a vested interest in doing those programs or, or seeing what you need on the outside. And, and that's probably the biggest thing I would tell people is do your own time. Come up with your own plan. What are you going to do for reentry? Don't let other folks tell you what your plan is. Really start thinking about realistically, what is my life going to look like when I get out of prison or when I start this transitional journey and what do I need to get there? 
And I think a, a, an important point on that for both the defense attorney and the individual that's starting the journey is to recognize the early documentation of that information to, to the extent that a person can, can start articulating that plan even before they meet with the probation officer, when they're doing the pre-sentence investigation report, we've done interviews with federal judges and the federal judge says, if the individual has done a good job of thinking and planning at the start of the journey, it's going to help, number one, the judge understand the, the plan for the individual from day one. It's also going to help the probation office. It's documented three years before he goes on supervised release. And then, to the extent the person continues to expand upon the record by accumulating certificates or skill sets or demonstrating he's building this incremental stage that shows he didn't only talk about it before he was sentenced, but then he built a plan that showed it. Now that individual's in a stronger position to show his case manager I'm a worthy candidate. That's the strategy that worked for me, and it's the one that I recommend. And I think we just heard that from an individual who is going to see the person on the other side of the journey. So I would really encourage people to listen to that point. Um, yeah, Mike, like you can't stress that enough. I mean, you've got to get everybody that's involved in, in this justice involvement. So like you said, the judge, the probation officer, the defense attorney, the client themselves, or, the, or you yourself as the, the client, really have to start planning in, incarceration is but a, hopefully a very small portion of your life. So what are you going to do after that incarceration and, and how do you build on that? So if you tell the judge that, hey, I understand, I'm really looking to better myself during this period of incarceration. I want to get a GED. I want to get a college degree. When I come out, this is the type of work I want to do. I want to rebuild my life with my family. That means a lot. But as you said, your actions mean even more. When you start showing that you're working towards those goals, you'll then have a seamless transition through incarceration. And because the flip, everybody the, sees it. Yeah. yeah, and the flip side of that, John, that I would encourage people because there's a lot of people now with one of the grow, fastest growing segments of the Bureau of Prisons and the Department of Justice is prosecuting white collar people that already have advanced degrees. And the mistake I think that they make is they say, well, I've already got a law degree. I've already got a medical degree. And as you pointedly said, well, that's not going to be your career path when you go home. The key to overcoming the challenges you're going to face in the future is no, showing that you're realistic and you have a plan. As the, as the Bureau of Prisons likes to see this incremental growth stage. And if, you're, if you've already got an advanced education, that shouldn't stop you from maybe creating courses and say, I want to be a teacher or I want to be, you know, work in this type of a capacity. And I've been building these modules. That's what worked for me. And it's what I really advocate, help people do is to build your own advocacy program, thinking about the conversations you're going to have three years from today. And what, are, what documentation are you building that memorializes your commitment to that, that progress. And when you, then when you get into the residential reentry center, you're also going to be able to argue for a higher level of liberty while you're there, uh, if, you've, if you've done that work effectively. Now, I wanna hear that from John. So, so now a person comes to you or to, into your area and the case manager's recommended and they're about to make the transition to a halfway house. Could you help us understand what that person's going to experience once they, once they get there? Yeah, so if I can unpack a little bit of what you said before I get to sure. the, the journey to the halfway house, because I think it's critical. Probably the, the, the most important things to do in preparing yourself for that halfway house journey in, in going back to lesser, lesser periods of incarceration, make sure you have an identification card probably the most critical, even if it's an outdated or, you know, expired ID, still having that ID card, your birth certificate and your social security card is critical for when you get to the halfway house. It's there, there's probably nothing more critical than ensuring you have that. And as Michael said, I really want folks to be realistic about their expectations when they go to the halfway house. A halfway house is still part of the incarceration journey. 
you're still in the custody of the attorney general, still in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons, and there's still rules that have to be followed. And Michael, you brought up a, an amazing point. You know, these the more white collar, the more upper class that we're seeing get prosecuted, we're also seeing a bigger sense of entitlement. That, oh, I want the full 12 months in a halfway house, I want the full six months on home confinement, and I'm entitled to it. Well, there's there's some problems with that, probably, especially fundamentally when you look at the way the Bureau of Prisons is processing these cases. The halfway house is designed for those who most need reentry assistance. So if you're somebody who was a lawyer or a politician or very well connected doctor in your, your previous life before you, you were sentenced and incarcerated, you probably need very little assistance with the reentry process. You need some time to get back with your family and to regain the family trust and all of that, but you're probably not going to go out and start job seeking and you're not looking for a place to live and you're not looking to actually build a network of support like individuals who have been incarcerated for very long periods of time and all they knew prior to incarceration was poverty and gang life or the criminal life and they really want to better themselves. Those are the individuals who most benefit from long periods of time in the halfway houses. But unfortunately, the culture in the Bureau of Prisons and the political culture has kind of gotten away from that. And everybody is looking at the First Step Act, the Second Chance Act and saying, hey, we have now this entitlement to longer periods of time in a, in a halfway house. But at the same time, the resources and the space available in the halfway houses has not increased, has not increased for about 10 years. It's very, very difficult to get new halfway houses. It's very difficult to site. So when you're looking at the philosophy behind placements, the institution will normally refer an individual for maximum amount of time. Hey, I want somebody to get, and most institutions based on security level have kind of their default. I'm gonna refer somebody for six months and almost everybody from this institution is gonna get referred for six months. I'm gonna refer for 12 months based on program participation and everything that's going on. So then the RRM office has to really start looking at those resources and really digging into the, the reentry planning and seeing, okay, what are this individual's needs compared to this individual's needs? And yeah, I agree that this individual has a greater need. He's done the programs. He's really got a reentry journey that's planned. He's put a lot of effort into doing this. This is the individual. I'm going to give a longer placement in the halfway house because I want to support him and I want to make sure that those needs are met. So when you're looking at this philosophy of halfway houses versus home confinement where you've already got a place to live, you've already got a job lined up, you don't need a halfway house. <clears throat> and in many cases, I'm doing you a disservice if I send you to a halfway house but most of the justice involved population and the population within the Bureau of Prisons, they just want to get out of the prison. So they're lobbying for this extensive amount of time in the halfway houses, which again is a very limited resource, very, very limited resource. We got about 7,500, 8,000 beds nationwide. And again, it doesn't change much year from year. It's just really, really difficult to get additional beds. But the thing we can get additional beds on and we can increase resources is that home confinement. So when you look at the First Step Act, when you look at the Second Chance Act, when you look at some of the rules language that's now coming out under CARES, the Bureau of Prisons really has to focus on, do you need the halfway house, yes or no? If not, we're going to put you directly out on home confinement and hopefully we can put you out for extended periods of time in an area where you're going to be the most successful based on what your reentry plan is. That is a, is a really key point, especially in light of, a, we published an article day before yesterday on a proposed rule change by the attorney general um, asking to endow the director with more discretion regarding how much time they can send somebody to home confinement. Were you familiar with that proposed rule change? I am familiar with the proposed rule change and I've read it fairly extensively. 
It's important to note, though, that that rule change only applies to those who were put out under the CARES Act. The, it doesn't give broad discretion for other categories of, of individuals that are put out on home confinement, only those under the CARES Act. So, so, so I'd like to get your take on a couple of things in res to what you just responded um, and to what you just said. When I, and I'm, and I'm going to first of all go back to personal experience. Those who are familiar with the Prison Professors Program know I was incarcerated for, for 9,500 days. And one of the strategies that I used several years before I got out of prison was I would write an unsolicited letter to the chief probation officer in the district where I wanted to, to start my life. And I didn't know who it was going to. I would just write to the United States Probation Office and in the Northern District of California, and I write, my name is Michael Santos. I've been incarcerated for, you know, 22 years. I expect to get out in the next three years or, or so. And I didn't know because I was old law, so I didn't know when I was going to get out specifically, but I could get a range within a year or so. And I said, when I come home, this is the career that I want to build. This is how I've prepared for it. This is the support I have built. This is where I expect to build. These are my financial resources. And laid all of that out. I didn't get a response, and I didn't expect a response. But I would keep writing them, first of all, like every quarter, the last couple of years, and then every month as I got closer. And when I went to the probation office, they knew who I was. And it was, I had a great relationship from day one and it allowed me to work for myself. It allowed me to have domestic rights to travel domestically from day one because they believed in me. I built that relationship over time. What you just said, John, if I would have known that while I was in prison, I probably also would have been writing to the residential reentry manager because that person, I want that person to know me. I want that person to know I'm not just saying what I want to do. Here's who I am. I don't expect him to write me back. But if I got out and my name is, oh, I know that guy, uh, I, it, it, how would, would that have been an effective strategy? So I don't think so. Okay. I think you, you're the strategy that you took and the strategy that I also encourage all the justice-involved people, the probation office is very, very powerful in what's going to happen in your reentry journey. Um, they're usually in, in committees with the RRM office. The RRM office is processing so many referrals for the community. If they get those kind of letters, they're going to put them in the shredder. But what I do encourage you to do is, is build that relationship with the probation office. Let them know what your plan is, because you, you mentioned self-employment. Self-employment is something that's scrutinized very, very heavily in the Bureau of Prisons especially when you're coming out to an RRC, it's very hard to track. But normally when somebody asks for self-employment, we ask the court, hey, is he going to or she going to be allowed to work at self-employment when they get out on supervision? If the courts come back and say yes, then that's probably something we're going to allow you to do pre-release while you're still in the halfway house also. But those type of communications and building a rapport, again, I mentioned it earlier, every time you go into a case meeting with your case manager, you should be taking a written plan in there and asking them to incorporate it into your, your inmate performance plan or your, your case plan with the case manager because the RRM sees that and they're reviewing it. They're looking to see what your conduct was while you're inside the prison. They're looking to see how did you behave, you know, what programs did you do, all of that. And to show that you've got that written plan and you continue to build on it, and every time you went in to see your case manager, you had a written plan, is really going to help that RRM make really good decisions about, hey, this is somebody who's going to be successful. And I, I've got one bed open and I've got a year. So do I put somebody who I think is going to be successful and use that program for the better good? for eight months and then the individual I, as, who has poor institutional behavior, lots of incident reports for the other four, or do I just split it and give each individual six months? Those are the type of decisions that the RRMs are making. And I always am going to try to facilitate the individual who I think is going to be the most successful in the program to have the longer length of time. So that brings me to the second part of my question um, first of all, I just want to emphasize that, that what 
what John just spoke us about is the importance of, of, of self-advocacy. Self-advocacy doesn't start when you're trying to solve the problem. It starts years before. And the way that you build that record that's going to support. We always talk about the importance of developing tools, tactics, and resources that will help you advance an argument against a very cynical sometimes agency. The more work that you have done, the more you are going to put yourself in a position to get the outcome that you want, which is why we say, you know, reentry should begin the day you're indicted and not, not the day you go to prison, not the day, not a month before, but it, this is your life and you've got to be thinking about it. Um, but you just said that um, one of the things that you said is that it, you, you were there when the implementation of the Second Chance Act and before Second Chance Act, you said that there, was, there were halfway houses and now reentry centers and now we have the First Step Act. You weren't in the prior of prisons, were you, when the Comprehensive Crime Control Act passed and RDAP came into place, or were you? I, w I was. So I was in prison before there was RDAP and after, and I was, in, I was in prison before there were new guidelines and before there were gu sentencing guidelines and then before there was RDAP. And these are the significant reform legislations that have happened over the past 40 years, the federal sentencing guidelines, then the Co Comprehensive Crime Control Bill, then the Second Chance Act, and now the First Step Act. And what I saw, John, is this gradual interpretation and rollout of these programs. The way RDAP was initially organized is different from how it's organized today. Um, meaning the, even the amount of time off. It, back then, everybody could get 12 months off, and then it went to right. nine, six. Yeah. And then the Second Chance Act, the day the Second Chance Act was passed, the, the administrator rolled it out a little bit differently than it is today, where now mm -hmm. we see it really embraced. At the beginning, I found resistance in 2008 to the Second Chance Act. There's a different era right now. And then the First Step Act really changes the mantra of the Bureau of Prisons in the sense of there's a huge emphasis on reentry and the importance of reentry into the plan more so than when I was in prison. And the reason I bring this up is because when I see something like the proposed rule, as you just said, it applies to the CARES Act only, I kind of look at tea leaves and say, wow, this is the kind of thing I saw at RDAP where there's, this is like an iteration and it's the first step and I see more steps and more steps. And I try to encourage people to say, well, you've got to anticipate what's going to happen five years from now. And right now the whole political landscape and the political language is different from 10 years ago. Right now we're hearing the president, we're hearing the attorney general talk about the importance of reentry. And 10 years ago, all we heard about was security of the institution. Right. So it's, it's different, and I get encouraged that I see things that says, even if it's the CARES, I want to give you more discretion. I'm going to encourage people, well, anticipate maybe in five years it's going to be different, and there will be opportunities to, uh, for the Bureau of Prisons to open more earned time credits and, and potentially for have somebody work towards saying, I can demonstrate I'm, I'm more worthy of, of home confinement. Is that... Anything, is there something that I've said there that you would find objectionable? No, Michael, I think you and I are in agreement and have taken the same journey, you know. I think <laughs> that every time legislation happens, there's always the, the thought process that, hey, this is a great step, but it doesn't go far enough. You know, the Second Chance Act obviously was one of those legislations, you know, with the five-factor review and some of the other stuff it really started putting this focus on reentry and how we can get more people to alternative forms of incarceration. But again, it didn't go far enough. It didn't get people to start looking at diversion. It didn't get people to start looking at, is this an individual who needs to be incarcerated at all? You know, I would always ask and, and always in my mind, if you're going to give somebody a 90 day sentence, why do they need to come to prison? You're, you're, you're trying to make a point, and I understand that, but there's other ways. There's diversion programs. There's other ways to do alternatives to incarceration that allow the individual to get the message and correct their behavior without that, that abrupt change of lifestyle that incarceration brings. So I think that was one piece of the Second Chance Act. I was really happy then when the First Step Act happened because it gave even more discretion and more authority to the Bureau of Prisons. 
But with any corrections agency, you're balancing security with, with programming. And I think you're changing the culture of an entire organization, and that takes a lot of time. You know, reentry is this really small group of, of folks when you look at it. You know, the, the 300 and some odd staff that work for residential reentry. And folks in the, in the Bureau 10 years ago didn't even think we worked for the Bureau. You know, they said, who is this residential reentry or community corrections at the time? Oh, you're probation officers. No, we work for the Bureau and, and we look to, to enhance the reentry programming in the Bureau through these community-based programs. But I think just getting all of that and getting the culture changed, I'm really excited with the news that, that Colette Peters may be coming into the Bureau of Prisons. Very progressive, very reentry, very um, humanistic director out in Oregon. And I think bringing that human element to the Bureau of Prisons right now is incredibly important. Start treating individuals as individuals, as humans, start giving them the programming and the tools that they need to succeed when they leave incarceration. That's really what the Bureau of Prisons should be about. I think Colette's really going to bring that to the Bureau of Prisons. And I'm excited about those opportunities. Um, as you said, the rules language under the CARES Act almost gets us there. It gets there so there are long ways, but it's, I think what it really shows is the will of Congress. And then when you get somebody like Colette Peters, who we've written about and who we've spoken about, what's shaped her career. One of the encouraging things about Colette Peters to me is her, if you look at her educational background and her career trajectory, it didn't come from the side of lieutenant to captain to head of custody that's focused on their whole mantra has been trained on protect security of the institution. She's looking more along, how do we make a safer community and have lower recidivism rates? And that's a that's something that you as an individual, if you're going into the system, need to think about. How do I demonstrate myself as an ideal candidate? The more I document the journey, the more I build a self-advocacy plan, the more I understand the system, I start building those tools, tactics, and resources. So, so I'm really enthusiastic about that. And, and, and I'd like to ask you now to get back into that, that segment. So somebody gets that halfway house. You said that it is possible for somebody to work for a, 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 a self-owned or a family-based business. If the person has a challenge from the halfway house, what steps should the individual take if, if they want to be self-employed? Yeah, so I, I think in anything that happens in the halfway house, um, we got to remember there's almost 300 halfway houses nationwide. You know, I like to say there's varying degrees of professionalism and there's varying degrees of ability across those halfway houses. By and large, we've got really, really good halfway house providers who really care about helping in the reentry journey. But there's always going to be times when you disagree with what the halfway house staff are saying. And I always encourage people you know, I have disagreements in my life. You have disagreements in your life. It's how you handle that adversity or how you handle those disagreements that is really going to set the tone moving forward. The Bureau of Prisons, the halfway house staff have incredible discretion in removing you from that halfway house. And disrespect is one of those reasons they can remove you from a halfway house or at least is going to get you very well singled out that this is somebody we're going to start scrutinizing very carefully. So when you talk to halfway house staff, you have to be very respectful and understanding that, that some of the individuals working at the halfway house just started and they're very, very young and they're, they're in some ways immature and they're learning, you know, starting in this work and, and starting in this field. And some of them get on, you know, where they're, they're looking at the power that they have over others. You still have to treat them with respect. And then you respectfully go up their chain of command. <laughs> you know, you have a security staff at the halfway house. You then have your case manager. You then have a supervisor and you have the program director. But always and in every halfway house, it's a requirement of the Bureau of Prisons that they have the representative names and contact numbers for the Bureau of Prisons who directly over that halfway house. 
And at least in my experience and in the staff I've, I've talked to, which is a great number over the years, when you call the residential reentry management office and you get a staff member on the phone, when you say, I'd like to discuss something that I observed at the halfway house that may have impacted me personally. And I'd like to talk through this situation and see if there's a way that maybe I could have handled it better or the staff could have handled it better. I'm now taking an approach where I'm not calling and saying, hey, the halfway house screwed this up and I deserve or I need this. No, I'm taking an approach where, hey, this has happened. I'm really I'm concerned about it. It has impacted me professionally, but can we work together to resolve the situation that's going to better the halfway house and going to better the programming for anybody that comes in behind you? And when you take that type of approach, it's really, really positive. And I'll tell you that it's it's positive throughout your period of incarceration, no matter if you're at the halfway house or, but so many people at the halfway house get into this mode where they don't think they're incarcerated anymore. They start to get this small taste of freedom and they're very stressed out. I have yet to meet somebody who's at a halfway house who's very relaxed and you know, you're getting all of this stuff thrown at you at one time. Go find a job, find a place to live, reintegrate with your family, start developing your family ties again. Well, if you've been incarcerated for any period of time, that's a, that's a stressful time. So understand and, and that you're dealing with this stress and you're dealing with all these other things and step back and relax and approach people, again, respectful, approach people the way you'd want to be approached and have these calm discussions, you're going to have so much more success in the programs. Even as the administrator for the branch, I would get letters in and, and individuals would write me and I'd read these and I'd say, well, this is, this is stupid. Why didn't they let him do this? Well, because everybody got up in their feelings and now it's a power thing. I'm going to show you that you're still incarcerated and you're not out labeled to do this even though I'm going to allow five other people to do the exact same thing, the way you approach me in that, put me on the defensive and I'm not going to let you do it because your, your circumstances are different and that's going to be the response. Well, we consider everything on an individual basis and your circumstances are different than theirs. So that that's probably the biggest thing I encourage people, step back, relax, take a breath, and be very calm, respectful about everything you do, and you're going to succeed. If you get in a position where they're starting to, I'm willing to show you, you're, you've lost. Yeah, <laughs> it's really important to throughout the journey in, in the system is that we can never undo the past, but we could always influence the future by the way we respond, speak slowly, non-threateningly, and document the journey. As he described documenting the journey, the earlier you are and building that self-advocacy package should not stop while you're in the halfway house. Continue documenting what are you doing and build that record so when you do have potentially the problem where you have to overcome a problem, you can show this record. So I would encourage you also to continue documenting everything that you're doing positively. Um, in the First Step Act, we have this uh, new terminology of earned time credits. And a lot of people have some confusion on how they are applied and whether they continue to, I mean, we say you're still in the Bureau of Prisons when you're in the halfway house. Do we continue earning those earned time credits when they're in the halfway house? And, and what do they mean? Do they apply to the BOP sentence or do they apply potentially to supervised release? Could you give us some insight on how uh, earned time credits will apply in, in somebody in the re residential reentry? Yeah. So generally, the rule that, that the Bureau of Prisons published after my retirement and something we advocated for before I retired was that the Bureau of Prisons consider RRC programming as uh, evidence-based programming to reduce recidivism, productive activities and getting jobs, getting back with family and all that. So the Bureau of Prisons published that they, they are now allowing that. They are now allowing you to earn additional credits within the RRCs. However, it's very, very difficult to track. With the 300 RRCs nationwide, all of them have a little bit different programming. 
So, Michael, as you mentioned, I think that's going, one of these areas that's going to continue to evolve. What I have seen recently is the first 12 months of earned time credits is generally going towards early release to supervision. So there, there's not a lot of people within the Bureau of Prisons right now, a lot of justice-involved individuals who have 12 months of earned time credits because of the time when the legislation was passed, by the time it went effective. What we're seeing right now is everybody's got 60 to 90 days of earned time credits, sometimes a little less. So those are automatically then going towards early release. So they're adjusting their release date on their sentence computation by the amount of time, earned time credits that they have. So that's really not impacting the halfway house time or the home confinement time. Be, All before, is th that, in be, fact is moving it, yeah. Before you go, that, that's such an important point. I want to ask some questions on that because you said it really relates to early release time. Does that mean it relates in the same way that RDAP takes time off of a sentence? It actually takes, t the Bureau of Prisons is taking the time off of the sentence if the person's accumulated those earned time credits? Correct. And when you look at your sentence comp or when, when individuals incarcerated are looking at their, their individualized sentence comp, when they see that they're a First Step Act release and it's an FSA release, that's exactly what it means. It means that they've taken those earned time credits. And if you had 90 of them, they're actually advancing your release date by 90 days. Wow. And I, I, I think that's that's critical to know because... There's a lot of confusion around, well, I've, I've been incarcerated for 60 days. That must mean that I earned 20 days of earned time credit. Well, maybe it does. And it depends on what programming you've done, what, what you know, productive activities you've done, and how that's been tracked. So everybody has to be really careful about, well, if I'm incarcerated for three years, then I'm going to get, you know, 10 days for every 30 days of my incarceration. Well, maybe you are. It depends on what you've done during that period of incarceration. And you should really ask your case manager, again, every single team, how that's being calculated. So that's relating while you're in prison. At the very least, it's advancing your time to go to the residential reentry center. You can cash them in that way. But then it also works on taking the sentence down in the same way that RDAP does. Is that accurate? No. So I think that there's, again, that's a period of where there's some confusion. So let's, let's stick with the, the 90 day earned time credit. So you're getting released 90 days earlier. So the unit team is still doing an independent evaluation under the 3621 to determine how much time you need in the halfway house. So they may, they can still use that up to 12 months in the halfway house. Or if you have 15 months of earned time credits, the first 12 months of that is going to apply towards early release. And the last three months of that is going to apply towards additional time in the halfway house. So that, that's going to be years away right. by the time somebody gets that significant amount of earned time credits. But that's how the rules language is currently written, is that the first 12 months of, of earned time credits go to early release. And then if the unit team is doing that determination, the five factor review under 3620 and says, Hey, Michael needs four months in a halfway house. You can apply any additional earn time credits towards additional times in that halfway house under the new rule and under the first step back. So what's important for somebody that's going into the system today that may have five years and he yeah. completely understands the system he's going to really populate a record so that when he's, he wants to transition into society, he's got every tool, tactic, and resource to, to work to his benefit. And uh, that's, that's what I, my takeaway would be. Now, now, when he's in the halfway house, is there some pattern or some uh, rule that he should, be, he should be knowledge about that will help him get to home confinement because there's a lack of beds in the halfway house, as you just said. There's not a lack of beds for people who have home confinement. What differentiates a person that, he, that they're sending him to a halfway house and leaving him in a halfway house, even though he has a stable home and a, 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 a pathway to work from home? Yeah, so a lot of things. So um, 
under normal authorities. So let's not talk about CARES Act right now, but I'll, I'll get to CARES Act and elderly offender pilot program here in a minute. But under normal authorities, home confinements list limited to 10% or six months. So if you go to the halfway house for a year, you must remain in that halfway house for six months before you're, you may become eligible if you get the full six months of, of home confinement. So there's that prohibition. You know, if you, if you do two, you know, 12 months incarceration, you're only going to get a, just over a month on home confinement under the, the general rules. Now, again, there, there are some exceptions to that rule. And CARES Act is one of those. So if you were put out in the community under CARES Act, you can get basically unlimited home confinement at the discretion of the Bureau of Prisons if you meet the requirements and you, you don't have one of the underlying prohibitive offenses. The, the short-sightedness of the, the CARES Act is it gave the Bureau of Prisons additional authority to put people on home confinement but it did not give them additional authority that if they get home and their significant other says, no, you can't live here. This isn't what I was prepared for. If that placement was longer than 12 months, they can't then go back to a halfway house. They have to go back to secure custody of a prisoner or jail, which I, I feel is really short sightedness of the law because through no fault of their own, they thought they had a viable release residence. When they got there, it was no longer viable. In some cases, we had individuals that were leaving the Bureau of Prisons, and by the time they got to the, the residence, they had COVID and nobody wanted them in. So really a fundamental issue. The other issue that came up and was, was very immediately relevant is you went from from about a normal population of about 3,500 to 4,000 individuals who are on home confinement at any time to about 8,000 who are on home confinement. And we got no additional resources in the halfway house staff to manage them. And the First Step Act requires that anybody on home confinement be monitored via electronic means. So GPS ankle bracelets traditionally. So you're putting all of this population out basically all at once at the at the time CARES Act was passed, or even now. And at the same time, the halfway houses and the staff that are monitoring them on home confinement have very difficult times getting people employed for, for all the same reasons that the economy right now is having difficulties with employment. And our contractors really had to adapt the way they were looking at and monitoring home confinement. And you saw that, that I put out several guidance memorandums myself on how we were adjusting that. But in doing that, we reduced the amount of oversight on the home confinement program. So, you know, in doing that, the Bureau of Prisons quickly looked at, okay, are there alternatives? Are there ways we can more efficiently monitor these large populations out on home confinement? And I, I think there's some real promising work that the Bureau of Prisons is still doing around that. But I think this is also the, the way the future is. I think you're going to see, uh, I, I agree with you. I think right now the discretion of the Bureau of Prisons to put somebody out on home confinement for longer than that 6% 10 month is only CARES Act. But I think probably very soon in the next year or so, you're going to see that discretion extended to all home confinement placements because it makes sense. They have if the data to... now that shows it. I mean, you've seen the data where they've published it. 96% was a success rate. That's better than time in a secure facility. Yeah. And, and truthfully, again, you have that portion of the population that really didn't need incarceration to begin with. And by having them monitored on home confinement and all that, it's, it's really the right way to do it. Now, we could argue all day whether the Bureau of Prisons should be doing it or probation should be doing it, but because they're two separate branches of government and they are in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons, the Bureau of Prisons is entrusted with monitoring home confinement today. But there are more effective and more efficient ways to monitor than the traditional ankle bracelet. And I'm hoping that Congress comes back and, and 
looks at some of that language that's in the First Step Act saying that everybody must be monitored via electronic monitoring and looks at some of the alternative ways to monitor individual. An ankle bracelet is technology from you know the, the 1950s and it hasn't changed since then. It's really outdated. It's just not the proper way to monitor people. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask, you've been so generous in your time with us and I, and I want to be respectful of that, but I do have one other question. If somebody, and there's a lot of people right now in this situation where they cares, they did release on CARES and they are in a halfway house, but they are capable of going home and, and, and living on home confinement and they have support to be at home. Is there a pathway that they should pursue to let the halfway house know I mean, the probation's officer has already been to the house. They've already approved the house. They've approved employment, but the person's still in the halfway house. What pathway should that person take to advance his candidacy should you be considering me for home confinement earlier? Yeah, so every policy, First Step Act, Second Chance Act, every law that's written encourages the Bureau of Prisons to consider individuals for placement on home confinement as soon as eligible and appropriate. In saying that, it gives wide discretion to the Bureau of Prisons on who they're going to place and, and when they're going to place. And there's a, just a ton of factors to consider. And you know, all of those include security, all of those include who are they living with, where, what was their, their crime about, you know, and all of those different factors also understanding that there's some consultation with the courts, with the prosecuting attorney, with the defense attorney about what was the intent of the court. So if you were, were incarcerated after COVID hit, so within the last two years, within the last two and a half years now, unfortunately, if you were incarcerated during that time, the Bureau of Prisons is immediately starting to look at Okay, so the judge knew that there was this pandemic going on and they still sentenced you to X amount of time. So we're going to put you in the community and we're going to put you out because you are at risk and there's less risk in the halfway houses than there is in the prisons. I think today there's only 20 halfway houses that have any, any COVID cases inside them but there's less risk. You can get better medical care, all these other things that are associated with being in the halfway house, better access to work and all that. But we're not ready to put you on home confinement yet because you've only served a very short period of your sentence. And we want to be very respectful of the judicial intention at the time of sentencing. So they have to look at that and they have to take that into consideration. They, they have to look at you know, who are you going to reside with? What's the living arrangements? I had individuals before I retired that were basically homeless and they gave an address under a bridge to the case manager when they left the institution. And when they got out to the community, we wouldn't let them live under the bridge. So we put them back into halfway houses. And it's very, very difficult for Bureau of Prison staff inside the institutions. I mean, you could be at FTC Seattle and somebody's releasing to Miami, Florida and knowing what that address is and knowing what those living conditions are makes it very difficult. So all of those factors, and, and there's, there's so many more factors that, that come into play about when are you appropriate and when do we feel it's right to put you out on home confinement and really what are your needs, you know? So, so thank you very much, John, for spending this hour with us. I'm going to follow up by, by, as we always do, is produce the content in a written format, which will be available on a PDF, uh, audio format on iTunes for people that want to listen and learn while they're driving, and also on this video format that we send inside the jails and prisons. The simple takeaway that I received from all of this and that would have been very helpful to me while I was in prison is I would have listened to a subject matter expert like John and recognize the importance of self-advocacy and taking a really methodical approach as early as possible of building and documenting a record all the way through so that when challenges come, I'm in the best possible position to 
advocate for myself and, and persuade stakeholders why I'm a worthy candidate for the highest level of liberty at the soonest possible time. And you'll see on the page of subject matter experts we have uh, the chief of probation, the, the former director of the Bureau of Prisons, and now the director of reentry centers. These is, uh, they're all providing a wealth of information that should help anybody going into the system. And John, is there anything that I didn't ask you, you think, that I should have asked you? Oh, Michael, there's so much we could cover. No, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the opportunity to help, hopefully help individuals in their reentry journey and, you know, make it more successful for them. That's really the intent of all of us. As a nonprofit organization, I'm really grateful to have access to John, and we're going to continue working on creating and developing programs to to help more people advance their, their journey into a successful return to society at the soonest possible time. And I'm really proud of that, and I'm looking forward to developing our relationship. And if you're watching this inside of a jail or a prison, I hope that you find uh, a pathway to build your career as a law-abiding contributing citizen when you come home. The sooner you start, the better off you're going to be. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, please uh, become a member of our community and make sure you visit us at prisonprofessors.com. Thanks.